Yeah. All right. And, all right. Maybe we should close the door because there's music going on outside. Hey everyone, welcome to our special topic training. This week we're going to be talking about the Frady Cat Protocol, which um, is something that is very special to this shelter. I've been working in animal sheltering for more than 20 years and I've never worked at another shelter where it would let us do something like this. Um, for a long time, very fearful cats were not considered socializable and so they often were euthanized at shelters. And even uh, authorities on cat behavior said that uh, socially feral cats were unable to uh, learn to be socially interested in people. So I'm really glad that we found out that that's not the case. Um, so I'm gonna get this uh, presentation on the screen. I should have done that before because this computer takes a long time to do stuff like that. Oh, first I have to do the share thing. Oh no. Okay. Sorry. I know it's the worst. Okay, I think this is what I need to click. Sorry, our mouse is broken. Okay. Uh, here it is. Oh. oh, yeah, you're right. We could plug in a mouse. That's true. I think it'll be fine. I don't really need to. Um, I don't really need to mouse around. <laughs> So, okay. So can you see that okay? Yes. Let me see if I can get this thing away. <laughs> it makes me laugh because it, everything says slow motion. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is pretty good. Okay, so um, so I'm I'm very I'm still very excited about the Freddy Cat protocol and socializing Freddy Cats. Um, what we're gonna do in uh, today is we're gonna talk about you know, what the protocol is meant to do and kind of the structure of the protocol, which is the meat of our discussion. And hopefully we'll have time to get into a couple of case studies. But if not, we can always talk about it another time because it's really interesting, the journeys of these cats. And, and um, even though we're gonna talk about the structure of the protocol, it's really different for every cat. It's a more general, idea of how the progress usually goes. So the Freight Cat Protocol is something we started using um, in 2018. And um, initially I started thinking about doing something like this because I saw Beth Edelman's video called Using Negative Reinforcement to Work with Scary Cats, or I think she says Fearful Cats in her video. And uh, I saw that video and I was really intrigued. It was about one case study of a cat who wouldn't take any typical positive reinforcers and was staying underneath her couch, I believe. And I was just really interested in that video because it was nothing that we'd ever done before. It's nothing that I'd ever done before. And then, um, and then of course I'd read Angela Renfro's Fearful to Friendly Protocol, which is on our Facebook group page as a file, but if you, um, if you need it, let me know and I can send it to you. It's free online and it's great. It's highly detailed and step-by-step -step going from, you know, a cat that we might call feral presenting up until a cat that's socially interested in interacting with people. And I really started, doing this because um, it was really all because of Celise, because we had been uh, hearing from uh, our local municipal shelter about cats in need. 
And at that time, they were um, cats that weren't immediately friendly and able to go to the adoption floor right away. They would uh, TNR them. They, they would, you know, alter them and then they would let them out somewhere. I believe in the middle of the night, somebody told me who worked there said that somebody would drive out in the middle of the night with these cats and kind of let them go. And I thought that was pretty inhumane because even if the cats were feral cats who lived outdoors um, to pick them up and just leave them somewhere, that's one thing, but they were also taking house cats um, and, you know, putting them outside. And um, they were calling for help for a few, for a few house cats um, who they didn't feel were physically able to go outside. And I was just about to go away on a conference and I got this email from police saying, hey, can we take these two like feral cats? <laughs> and I was like, uh, okay. Um, and I went away uh, and I came back and there they were. And this was my chance to start using this different kind of protocol. And they were both, pretty amazing successes. And, um, and so here we are today. This is something that we do all the time, every day. Um, who, what kind of cats benefit from the Frady Cat Protocol? Um, well, any cat that comes into the shelter and they're looking fearful, they can uh, respond well, uh, especially to the initial phases of the protocol. But the cats that really benefit the most are the ones that um, have limited to no social exposure to humans, or they can just be so traumatized by the transition to the shelter that they won't take any traditional po uh, positive reinforcers like food, treats, play, affection, those types of things. You can't, some of them you can't even get close enough to them. They can be really defensive. And those are the ones that uh, this protocol works the best for. And the goal of this protocol is to um, counter condition them to associate the presence of humans. I wrote presence. <laughs> um, with, uh, with pleasant experiences. So, um, and also encourage uh, and reinforce pro-social interactions with humans. So essentially our hope is that at the end of the protocol, the cats will see us as potential friends and you know, even worth having physical contact with. And one of the most important lessons, I believe, from the Frady Cat Protocol is that working with fearful cats is more than just you know, just having the time and just waiting for them to come around on their own and feeding them. I always say love is not always enough because in this case, I mean, sometimes cats, uh, very fearful cats will come around with just patience, time and treats. But then I've heard story after story where somebody, you know, takes in a cat from the street and, uh, and it's seven years and the cat's still not comfortable or, you know, Beth probably knows of a lot of situations where they pick up the cat from the street and the cat's been living in their house for a year and then the cat's still, you know, right, terrified right. one. We got to a cat and it was years and she was never, I remember I started crying the first time she was able to stay in the same room with me. Aww. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah, and that doesn't have to happen, right? I mean, you know, um, sure, we've had cats stay with us for months, and I'm trying to think of cats that uh, started the 3D call, cat protocol, and were not able to get to like some kind of social interest phase within a year, but I just can't think of any, right? Like, um, like Priscilla was here for a very long time, but for most of that time, or at least half of that time, she was socially interested in us. I can't think of any cats. You know, probably Gizmo was one who was with us for a very long time, but we only started doing the Freddy Cat program um, in the last two years. So, I mean, I just can't think of it. So it's, it's quite fast. It's, 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 a, it's a fast process. So if you know somebody who, you know, works with 
fearful cats and they've got this cat for years and years and years and the cat will not approach them and make contact with them, then that's a serious problem. You know, email them the fearful to friendly protocol. Okay, that's a big deal to me, this love is not enough business because, you know, people, whenever we post on our Facebook, oh, you know, look at this cat, what a great success. And people are like, oh yes, you know, just give it enough time. And I'm like, no, no, don't give it enough time. Give it structure, you know, stay below the cat's threshold, be predictable. Um, here's the Freddy cat protocol. Okay, so um, if, do you guys have any questions before we go on to the, to the different phases? Okay. So the first phase usually actually starts before the cat gets in. So, you know, like Beth knows that when we do get free cats, I often have questions like, where did the cat come from? And Beth's like, I don't know. <laughs> but if you do, great. <laughs> yeah. Or like, I've, called, uh, I've called Bark before about, you know, like this, about various cats. And sometimes I get an answer, you know, where did this cat come from? Did this cat uh, live? indoors at all um, because a lot of times you're dealing with the fear of humans or the fear of new humans but also you're dealing with this um, animal who's never been inside before and that's also a huge um, a huge issue and you'll want to know about that um, is a cat socially feral so you know a lot of people when they see feral cats they just mean cats that live outside when i say that a cat is Feral, I mean that they're socially feral, like they don't, they have never shown any pro-social interest in humans, uh, meaning they've never, you know, voluntarily wanted to interact with people except to maybe get food. Um, do they have pro-social interactions with humans in their home where they're the most comfortable? Because if they don't, that's something that we'll want to know. Have they ever, you know, Aside from being friendly with humans, have they ever solicited affection from people? And, um, and what do they like? You know, what kind of treats do they like? Do they like to play? Those are things that we like to know about. We, we don't often have the luxury of uh, getting that information, but it's helpful. At the same time, when you do have that information, um, what the cat is telling you at that moment, at every moment that you're interacting with the cat trumps all of that history. So, you know, usually when we talk about behavior evaluations, we say the history trumps the evaluation. But when we're actually working one on one with these creatures, with these beings, what the animal is telling me at the moment is more important than what their person told me. So, all right. So once the cat's in the shelter, um, they're going to need to be set up properly here. They're going to be set up properly in their, in their space. So just tell me, you guys probably know already, tell me some things that, what do you think a cat needs in their space? And this is for all cats, but especially the, the fearful cats because um, we're going to want to mess with their stuff as little as possible in the first, you know, week or a couple weeks. So what do you think they might need? Yeah, a place to hide. And specifically for the, so every cat uh, in every shelter and uh, every kennel should have a place where they can hide. But the fearful cats really should have a place that could double as transportation because then later you can move them from place to place rather than, oh no, having to get a crate there and the cat doesn't want to go to the crate and they freak out and it doesn't smell right. And um, so this helps you when you start them off right with a, a transport uh, crate in there. Uh, we often use these feral cat den. So in this photo, you can see, oh no, the mouse doesn't work, but you can see over here. This guy over here is a feral cat den. Um, and it's got two openings and it's just, I don't know, it's practically bulletproof. That's what I've heard. <laughs> and, um, and it makes a great transport and we do not steal them from other shelters. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what else do they need? Water and litter all. 
yeah. separate from each other. Right. right. Yeah, they should have their food, water, and litter. And ideally, they should be like two feet apart. Like food should be two feet away from water, should be two feet away from litter. All of them should be two feet away from each other, ideally. Um, anything else that you can think of? They need a lot of things. Melissa, can you elaborate on why you want the food and the water bowl so far apart? Yeah, because this is just the natural preference of cats to have those items separate from one another. They have really keen senses of smell and they don't want, you know, their fresh water adulterated by the smell of their food and their, you know, poo. <laughs> I think I heard something somewhere as well, like um, it comes from like their natural feeding tendencies where they don't want to eat near their water supply because whatever they're eating could rot and then permeate into the water supply. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Anything else you can think of? It does say right here, but there's more stuff that's not on here. Yeah, toys, and this is, this is a key thing too because before the Freddy cats come into the shelter, you wanna make sure that you put those toys in there because Later, if the cat's afraid of you, you don't want to put toys in there because it's not worth the fear. So like after the cat's in there and you might want to put toys in there, but them being so scared of you putting the toys in there is not worth them having toys later on. So put those toys in there, put um, the scent enrichment in there. You know, we use the, the, uh, the valerian, Vetiver spray. What's the brand of that called? Oh. It's not Pet Rescue. Pesky, pet Remedy. Pesky. Pet Remedy. Pet Remedy Calming Spray. A lot of cats like that. Um, and then Silver Vine. Uh, I think I said catnip. But um, just put some, you know, put those things in there um, because later you won't have an opportunity to until the cat's feeling a little bit more comfortable with you. Um, they also need a perch, so they need something to jump up on because some cats really prefer being up high. And they'll need bedding in their hiding spot and outside. They need a choice of those two. Um, and then here I have some more things. Mm, scratching post? Yes, yeah, scratchers. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's hard to tell what their preference is going to be. I would say in an ideal situation, they would have horizontal and vertical scratchers. Um, and, and then they'll want some privacy. But more than all of that, you know, we cover them. But more than all of those things, they'll need space. And, um, and I, I've been talking about this for the last, I don't know, couple of weeks. Or, I mean, it's been in my head for a long time but our cats don't have enough space. So you might not realize, but uh, pretty recently, the minimum uh, area requirement for, for shelter cats has increased. So cats who live in kennels should have at least 11 square um, you know, feet of uh, floor area. So that's about twice as much as kind of the traditional um, Kennels, right? The traditional kennels are like two by three by two, or, you know, I mean, if you're lucky, it's like three by three. So that's, you know, it's quite large. And what they're recommending nowadays is that you can um, double that space uh, by putting two kennels together. So here's a photo of a modern uh, setup for a cat where they have the two kennels, it's a double kennel, and they have the porthole in between. Um, also, uh, cats should not ideally live all the time at floor level. So for our bottom kennels, you know, this is not an ideal situation. Um, ideally, if the cats have a bottom kennel so that they can access outside without being carried, they would have a portal up top so they could live upstairs too. Right, so they can choose if they're upstairs or downstairs. Okay, so you've set them up and you've covered them up. Um, you're just kind of being quiet and, um, and advising everyone around to be quiet for the next 
few days. So um, how do you know when, do you move, when to move to the next phase? So what we do is we uh, keep an eye on you know, how well they're eating. And I look for um, if they've been eating for four days consecutively pretty heartily. So you know, if people come in in the morning and they can't really tell if the cats have eaten anything, that doesn't count. So um, I'm just looking and I do ask around. A lot of people have I've come up to them and been like, hey, is so-and-so eating? Uh, because I want to make sure that their like basic survival needs are met before I start gradually opening up their cover. And I do that, you know, just an inch and a half, two inches at a time. I'll gradually move over their cover over the course of a couple days. And then we move on to negative reinforcement. So, um, so this is kind of the controversial part of the protocol because a lot of people worry, you know, we've, in fact, in the last few weeks when I was talking about um, seeing different behavior problems in consult, I was always talking about the humane hierarchy and, you know, first you do all this stuff and then negative reinforcement is like way, way at the bottom. Um, and in Lima, negative reinforcement is not you know, it's pretty invasive because you have to apply an aversion uh, for it to work. And so isn't, isn't negative reinforcement bad? And uh, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of controversy around that. And I've also personally heard a lot, had a lot of criticism uh, based on our use of negative reinforcement. But um, the fact is that most of these cats are just not in a condition where they can take any reinforcer, any positive reinforcement. You know, they're not going to eat, they're not going to play with you, and you know, there's not a lot you can do, but what you can do is think about what they want at that moment. And what they want most is safety and security. And they get that uh, when you're not there, right? Most of these cats who uh, don't have a lot of social interest in people, they're gonna feel the safest when people aren't there. So very generally, um, and if you want more detail, do look at uh, Angela Renfro's Fearful to Friendly, because she goes over in detail what to do. But basically, we stand as far away as we can where we can still see the cats, over the cat, and um, and we're waiting for them to do something that we can reinforce. Uh, Angela Renfro has a whole list of desirable be desirable behaviors. Um, usually, blinking is the easiest to notice, and it's nice because it translates later into prosocial behavior. So that's why I put this blinking kitten here. It's really hard to get this uh, behavior on video because the cat's usually way back in their kennel. It's kind of dark and you're standing way over on the other side. And um, it's hard to get a video of what you and the cat are both doing at the same time. So um, you're gonna be as far away as you can right in the beginning. And, um, and when the cat blinks, you're just gonna walk away. You're not gonna really say anything. You're just gonna leave right away. And um, and then what are you going to do right after that? Nothing. You're going to stay the heck away from that cat <laughs> because you're using, you know, you could say that you're negatively reinforcing the blink. Oh, can somebody explain for those of us who don't know negative reinforcement? What does negative reinforcement really mean? To remove an aversive to make the behavior a more likely. Right, you're taking something away, and usually it's something aversive, something unpleasant. And, it, and you take something away after a behavior happens to make the behavior more likely to happen. So if the cat finds my presence aversive and they blink, me leaving should make their blinking more likely to happen. Because if they realize that they can control me by making me go, you know, by blinking to make me go away, they're going to do that a whole lot faster. Um, so that's what negative reinforcement means. It doesn't mean that I'm, you know, 
punishing them exactly in the traditional sense. So whenever you have negative reinforcement, it's really important to have a long intertrial duration, which means after you finish um, having one, uh, one trial, so when the animal has done the behavior one time, that means a lot of time has to pass before you train that behavior again. So people always say, well, repetition is key. Well, in negative reinforcement, the, the time that you're not working on the behavior is key, right? Um, it's important because if you think about it, you're kind of positively reinforcing the blinking by giving them safety or giving them that perceived safety. And so you want that safety to last. If you kept coming back right away, then would it really be worth it for the cat to blink? You know, it might not, that behavior might not get reinforced ad adequately. So um, once the cat has blinked four times in a row at whatever distance you're starting at, then you can, um, you know, you can move one foot closer. And when I say one foot, I mean like your foot. You know, just take one step closer than where you started from. And, um, and then you also want four blinks at that distance consecutively. So if you get two blinks and then the next time you're waiting for more than a minute and you don't get a blink, then that doesn't count, right? So you can't get closer. So um, you want your blinks pretty soon. For a cat, one minute isn't too bad. It seems like a long time, but it's not too long to wait for a blink. Okay, some, some tips are to, uh, when you're looking at the cat, you don't wanna like stare at them right in their eyes, you know, you know, ventral, ventral facing because that's pretty, uh, that's pretty intimidating. So you kind of want to stand with your side facing the cat and you blink too. So blink too to encourage the cat to blink. You can also do stuff like, you know, tiny flicks, like kind of lick your top lip. And that's something that might encourage blinking too. Okay. Any questions about the negative reinforcement phase? So if you're waiting for a cat to blink at you and like nothing is happening, do you just keep waiting or at some point do you walk away? Um, I would wait as long as I could and just making sure that I was as far away as possible because the cat's going to have to blink. You'll be surprised though how long a cat can go without blinking. And so here in the case is like the aversive nature of the situation. Yes, the cat's not going to like that. but. Um, but when the cat can control your departure, then their feelings change really quickly over time. Yeah, that's a good question. Anyone else? Okay. So, so basically, over time, you're going to get one step closer and closer to the cat until you're just right in front of their kennel, right? And you're going to be close enough to the kennel that you can start trying out some positive reinforcement. Um, so you can move on to this next phase only if you're close enough that you can reliably get the reinforcement to the cat. So if you're like flicking a treat over to the cat and it's like bouncing all over the place, no, that doesn't count. You've got to get closer. Um, so you're going to be close enough. I mean, and, and that's different for different people. Like I'm, I can be a lot further away than I used to be able to be. Uh, just because I'm a little bit better at flicking the treats than I used to be. Um, and it's critical that you select a behavior that's different from the behavior that you've been negatively reinforcing, right? Blinking makes people go away. Great. Do not try to reinforce that with a treat because it's kind of sabotaging the cat, uh, what the cat's learned to use to communicate with you. You know, I would say at that point, you know, eye contact works really well because they do it very often. But again, Angela Renfro has a whole list of uh, desirable behavior. And if the cat blinks, maybe just back up a little bit instead. How does she figure all this stuff out? Like one day you're just sitting with the cat, the cat start blinking or? Um, I was her master's thesis and she's, oh, okay. a, she's a, she was in graduate school for, um, 
for applied animal behavior. It was, it was her thesis. So um, anyway, so you're gonna also try a bunch of different things. So, you know, you might try, I like to use the crunchy treats because they're just so easy to get to the cat. I mean, it's my preference. Um, but I'll also try some moist or wet foods. So canned foods, I love to try um, like really stinky foods like the um, BFF is one of my favorites. Um, you can try uh, squeeze ups or like lickable treats in a tube. But you know, those things, including the stuff in the tube, should go on a on a long stick, like a chopstick or Kevin Rook really quite really kindly donated to us a bunch of these wooden stirs that work perfectly because they're very flat and it's easy to put stuff on them. Um, so because the reason I say that is because a lot of cats don't um, they don't prefer to take the stuff from the squeeze up tube. The squeeze up tube is kind of scary. It's pokey. It gets them in the face. So it's it's like there's a learning curve involved there. So better just use the stir. And um, folks in the past have used long handled like iced teaspoons, but I'm not sure I would recommend that because on the off chance that the cat gets spooked and bites it, it could hurt them. So I love to use the wooden disposable things. Um, and if food does not work, and only if food does not work at all, and only if your proximity doesn't seem to be causing stress to the cat. So I'm going to assume that when you're doing this protocol that you're pretty fluent in cat behavior. Like you've done your BB2, you've done all your ethograms. <laughs> so you, you know, you read, you know, uh, starting from scratch, you've observed a lot of cats. You're not just starting out. You're not, you know, you're not a newbie at reading cat behavior. And you can tell that that cat looks pretty relaxed. Um, then you can cautiously try play as a reward with a, with a wand. Um, th the reason that I say this is because it, I, I successfully use play with cats that are relatively early on in their Frady cat protocol, but there's a huge risk that the toy will scare the cat and send you back. Um, you do not want to go backwards with a cat. You don't want to make a mistake. And the reason is that cats are less resilient than dogs. They do not, uh, I've probably mentioned this to you guys before, they do not show conciliatory behaviors like dogs do and humans do. So once you've uh, done something by them and they feel um, that, you, that they associate you with some scary event, then you're going to be associated with that event and it's gonna be harder to, to erase that from their memory. That's why it's not a good idea to experiment too much, it's generally, but especially with cats. Um, okay, so here's a video, hopefully, of um, this actually, is, is, I think it's Choo Choo, um, and you can see me flicking the hard treats to her and I'm reinforcing eye contact. So you can see that I don't say anything to get her to make eye contact with me. I'm just kind of silently waiting there. And I don't know if you can tell from the video, but I'm not like super, super close to her. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. I think I missed one there. Okay. Very simple, but um, very simple. Notice also that the rate of reinforcement is relatively high. So I'm not like waiting a lot it, uh, for her to make eye contact with me. It's very um, 
like Alexandra Perlin would say, it's very loopy training. It's like she looks at me, I give her a treat. She looks at me, I give her a treat. She looks at me, I give her a treat. It's very like rhythmic. Um, okay. So once you've got that eye contact and you can reinforce it. Yes. <laughs> I, I have a question oh, no, about that video. That's not what I wanted to see. <laughs> Hold on for a second. I'm trying to stop this. Yes, ask the question so I can figure this out. Uh, it, it sounds like you either you or the cat made a sound every time you gave it a Ah, uh, yes. I was, oh no, I was um, saying good. Every okay. time she made eye contact with me, I marked behavior, the behavior by saying good. Okay. And um, it's, you know, you don't always have to mark the behavior with the, you know, when you're training, but it can be useful because eventually, uh, well, you want the cat to be used to accept your voice. Uh, well, maybe I can go, go like this. Um, you want them to be used to you talking to them. And um, it's nice for them to know exactly what they did that earned that reinforcer. So like, say, um, and, and say you're not as good at getting the reinforcer to the cat, like I've dropped many, many treats before, or like I've spilled like the cat food on my leg or whatever. And um, so you want to make sure the cat knows that even though some time passed before they did the, be between when they did the behavior and they got the treat, that um, the behavior that they did is what earned the treat. So if you mark it, that makes it um, possible for the cat to know that, aha, uh -huh, that's what earned the reinforcer. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. Um, some people, it, some people don't use a, a marker with the Frady cats because they feel like it's pretty scary for them, but I don't, I haven't had that experience. And I think I started out without using reinforcement for uh, a secondary reinforcer, um, but I changed my mind. I think it works great. Thank you for asking that question at that, at that moment. <laughs> it was perfect. Okay. So, so here's another um, example of what we might do after eye contact in the positive reinforcement stage. So let's say I'm getting eye contact. Um, you know, what's so amazing about these first behaviors that you reinforce is that they can turn into default behaviors. So does somebody want to say what a default behavior is just because it's a very common theme? Well, I'll just go ahead in the interest of time. Oh, Suzanne, talk. it says talking, Suzanne Turner. <laughs> no. Okay, fine. I think that's you. Oh, okay, yeah, Emily wants to take a stab. Oh my god. Um. So it's basically like they learn that those are the behaviors they can offer to get something that they want. Kind of like when you're doing auto sit and auto down, like you'll see them start offering these behaviors of like, let me, I'm trying to figure out what I can do to. Yeah. Offering. Um, and yes, I mean, you're right in the way that they're like, um, they initiate, right? It's their initiating of training. And so when, it's like the automatic nature of the behavior is critical. So you notice that Choo Choo did not, I didn't tell Choo Choo to look at me, right? Choo Choo just did it. And when she does that, I can turn it into um, a behavior that starts my training for something else. And if she is the one that initiates uh, further training, then I can tell if she's comfortable with the training because let's say, okay, we can watch this video. And in this video, Pam is training, this looks like Priscilla, and she is training her to accept the extension of Pam's empty hand. So Pam is teaching Priscilla that when Pam extends her empty hand, that she should associate it with getting a treat. So we call that counter conditioning. She's counter conditioning her to associate hands being stuck out at her with something good. Now, this could be a really scary experience for Priscilla. So um, 
the tool that we're using to as a barometer to tell if Priscilla is comfortable is the default behavior, which happens to be eye contact. So when Priscilla makes eye contact with Pam, she's telling Pam that, okay, it's okay to start this training. And then Pam holds her hand out and then gives her a treat. And then Priscilla looks at her again right away. Okay, Pam, you can train me again. And then Pam holds her hand out and she gives a treat. So this is something uh, that we've known for a long time uh, in research that when animals feel like they controlled exposure to a stress stimulus, that the stress related to that stimulus is much diminished. So um, it's just something that we've started using very recently in dogs and cats, but this is something that we've known for a long time that exists in many other animals like that. Um, I don't know why it took us so long. He's training you. That's yeah. such a dean <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> but yes, we do this with many of our animals. Yes, we use this on many, many of our animals. So here's this video, hopefully this works. Oh, see, she's looking. And then Pam extends her hand, and then she gives her a treat. Is she treating her with the hand she's extending, or just? Uh, I think she's treating her with the same hand because the other hand's holding the bag of treats. It doesn't really matter then. See, eye contact. Hand and then treat. Yeah, she doesn't have a treat in her hand though. <laughs> is she putting them in or is she She's just putting the treat in because Priscilla's right there. I have to say that we've I've already done this. I had already done this with Priscilla many times, so she's just I don't know, it wasn't a new thing for her. Typically, when I'm first starting cats out with this exercise, I'm holding my hand really close. I just, they look at me and I just go like this. I'm not reaching a lot. And would you flip the treat usually, or would you go and flip it? If I were far away, I would flip the treat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, this is great because this exercise is huge because it's the bridge between this no contact exercises uh, like eye contact and some contact exercises like targeting. So what happens is that you're just showing the cat your empty hand like Pam was. You're not going over and touching the cat. You're just showing them your hand. But when you classically condition them to associate your hand with the treat, what happens? Like I recently gave a talk about this. Do you guys remember this? So something automatically happens that makes them want to touch a hand. Do you know what it's called? Anybody? I yeah, but it's not because your hand smells like treats. Like it would also work if you use a different hand for um, giving treats or something else. Yeah. No. Is it desensitization? I mean, it's counter conditioning. Hopefully, desensitization is also happening. Okay. So I'll describe it one more time. So I'm really hoping you get it. <laughs> I never get it. I'm so hoping that you guys get it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> listen. Listen. Okay. So you're using classical conditioning to associate the hand with the food, and over time, the cat will make that association. Hand equals food. Then they'll automatically start showing instinctive behaviors that are related oh, auto -shaping. to food. Yes, auto shaping. <laughs> auto shaping happens, right? Like if then they're starting to treat your hand like it's food, so they approach it and touch it, and that's where it happens, right? We don't 
ever go to our Brady cats and touch them and be like, okay, here's some food. No, we don't do that. We wait until it gets to the opulent level. Okay, so I wish I had, I wish I had a video of that moment. I don't, but maybe one of you will, will bless me with one of those. Why do I keep doing that? No, sorry. I'm, we're having, uh, we're having uh, weird computer problems because of the mouse. If you know anyone who has a computer, they would like to donate to us. That would be amazing. Melissa, I don't think I'm allowed to take any more videos. You know, why? Because I keep getting bad for Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and Dean. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so here's the next step, right? Like, so auto shaping has happened and then the cat is starting to target your finger through the protected contact there, so through the bars. So this is precious, my precious. Do I have to do that? Yes, I do. So again, I'm not saying anything to her. I'm just holding out my finger. She makes contact with it and it's her treat. And I make a mistake because she takes the treats from my hands, but ideally you should, you should just let them fall into there because you don't, you know, want to unnecessarily feed her from your hands. I see she's making that eye contact with me still. She's looking at me. I'm holding my hand out. So she still has that eye contact as a default behavior. So she's saying, Melissa, please stick your hand out so I can touch it and then get treats. So she's in control, so she feels really safe. And in this case, I'm sure that I don't have any treats in my hand that she's targeting. Very good. Okay. Now I don't want to push the wrong button again. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the next, the next level is you want to start moving from protected contact to free contact. So you don't want the barrier there. And unfortunately, because these cats have to be cleaned every day, they're pretty afraid of the door being open. That is a big, scary thing. And, and these are very noisy doors to the kennel, so you, you have to be super uh, wary of that. So in this case, I'm using the default eye contact with Precious, and I am counter conditioning her uh, to the opening of the door, which is a process, right? I'm not gonna open the door right away. I'm gonna just touch the door. Then I'm gonna jiggle the door. Then I'm gonna, you know, open it a teeny tiny bit and then I'll open it more and more. So, and you'll also see that I'm doing the default behavior too. For all of these, whenever I expose her to something new that's potentially scary, she has that default behavior so that she stays in charge. Oh, sorry for all that <laughs> baby talk. She's ready to go. She's like, she's making eye contact with me from the beginning. She's eye contact. I touch her door. So in this case, she's already done some counter conditioning with the with uh, targeting my finger. So now this is a very quick process. Like I would say you probably just took like one or two sessions to be able to open the door. I think probably two because I think I show here the first, this is the first one and then, and then I show the second one in a bit. <laughs> you should try this. Try try it, but not when you're cleaning. You try it like, you know, at times that are not. So time is so important with cats. And I didn't really mention it just in the um for the sake of brevity, but it the time that you choose to work with cats is so important. You know, they just get used to um 
good things happen at certain times and not so good things happen at other times. So opening the door here. And I don't think it shows it here, but I'm eventually, you know, able to open the door and take her stuff out, you know, when she throws up on her bed or whatever. <laughs> Can take that out without any problem. And I heard, uh, I heard from Dulce that she doesn't have any trouble feeding her now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the thing is like, we really want to avoid that because we don't want her to talk about, like, even though we might, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, we don't want her to have any negative feelings with her. Okay. Okay, so. So now you're working with a free contact. So you don't have the barrier, and now you can do the hand targeting. So here we're going to start the process to um, to social contact, to, um, you know, working towards affection. So we're gonna start with just finger targeting. This is Taro and he is targeting my finger. And I'm slowly going to start using um, reward placement or luring to get him to target my hand with the top of his head. So I start with the finger, um, then I start um, reeling my finger in to like a loose fist. You'll see it in the video. So I'm gonna have like kind of a cupped hand and um and then i'm going to hold my treat underneath my palm which is going to be facing down so that he has to push up against my hand to get the treat oh that's great there you go clean old finger targeting <laughs> Why did I give him extra for biting my finger? I don't know. So there are my, so you can see that I've got like a loose fist with my palm facing down. <laughs> Very satisfying. Short-term soy And again, I'm not telling him to do anything. It's all very automatic. Um, I think this is starting over again, right? Looks like it to me. No, it's not. It's pretty nice. Let's see. Maybe it'll get to the point where I show that he is touching me with the top of his head. <laughs> Just that's walking past. This is different sessions, so I'm not like feeding him tons of treats all in one session. This is probably over the course of three sessions. Oh, almost. I think I'm starting to uh, reinforce him kind of tilting his head down. You notice here that I didn't use a default behavior, and I think it could have worked it a little bit better that way. But I mean, Tara is pretty, pretty easy. Uh, 
aha, see there, like I'm, I'm marking, but in order to retrieve the treat, he's got to touch my hand. He's got to like push his, there. Yeah. Oh yeah, Dean was trying to do that too. Yeah, so I don't know if you could see it, but I say yes when he targeted me. When I put the treat kind of underneath my hand, he had to like nudge my hand to get it. And so that's creative uh, treat placement. Okay, so then you have this, um, you have the targeting with the top of the head. So this is crucial because eventually this is going to turn into headbutt or bunting. Um, so here is a video that shows that process. So I'm going to describe it to you first and then we can watch it so that you know what to expect. So this is Muffin. She's one of our Freddy cats that was here and she's since moved to foster. She's not adopted yet. Um, she's kind of an old lady cat. I think she's like 13, 16, something like that. Yeah. She's old, but she's she, yeah. um, But she looked pretty terrible. I don't know if anybody well, remember her. I don't know how. What you did? So, so yeah. I mean, she went through the whole protocol from start to finish, and. Um, this was just like kind of her starring moment though. She was really good at this exercise. She's 13. She's 13. Um, so she basically started off, I, I shaped uh, the uh, reinforce, I shaped the um, targeting with her forehead against my hand. And, um, and then in this video, it shows how um, I turned that into actually head biting. So in the beginning, I, um, she was touching me with the forehead and then she would get a treat and I start introducing kind of like petting movement. And then eventually the petting becomes the reinforcer itself. And then I start introducing longer petting or also unsolicited petting, which is the key. And she also uses a default behavior, I believe is eye contact. I can't tell. She's big. Oh, there, see, that's a, touching my hand with her head, so it's not affection yet. Okay, so here I'm starting to add the scratching, <laughs> which is the reinforcer now. Oh yeah, declawed cats are often, they're often pretty, oh, so here's like unsolicited touching, right? Because people are gonna do that to cats. Yeah, I'm like, I'm going to touch you and I'm going to touch you a little bit longer. But of course, I'm always reading her body language, right? I'm not going to touch her if she's like not wanting to be touched. Yeah. Yeah, and this is like full body touching. She was such a sweetheart. I love having Muffin at the shelter. And you can teach old cats new tricks, right? Like people are always like, oh, this is just an old grouchy cat. <laughs> this is an old grouchy cat who, you know, only knew basically one person. Okay, so, um, so what's next? Like after you've made friends with the cat, they're soliciting affection. Um, what do you do? So very often in, uh, so at the shelter, if the cat solicits affection from two people, or if they approach two people in a pro-social way, so, you know, the cat can be friendly, but just maybe doesn't want to be petted, then they can be moved up front. So there's that whole transition. Um, and that transition, if they get along with other cats, one of the rooms, 
And it's important that whoever's, um, whoever's made that bond with the cat, they have to um, be there with them for that transition. So, you know, as we've moved uh, Taro just recently into uh, Rocky's room and we moved uh, Polar and we moved Evie there, you know, I've gone with and visited them many times over the course of this transition and it really helps them. There's a super, this amazing video, um, we should watch it together sometime called The Social Lives of Cats. And it just shows how important having the stable bond is uh, for the cats in making transitions to scary places. Once you've transitioned them to wherever they're gonna go, um, it's, it's nice to have them in a large space where you can introduce them to new people. So here are just some, uh, uh, here's uh, some images of uh, Frady cats meeting new people. On the left uh, is Vernon, and he was one of our original Freddy cats. And he was meeting uh, John, who ended up adopting him. And he was uh, 16 or 17 years old at the time. He was from Bark, and he was, you know, one of those candidates for TNR. When obviously a cat who's that old shouldn't be turned out into the streets, especially if they were a house cat before. He was super, super fearful. I think I have the pictures of him from, um, from his case on the next slide. And then here's a video of uh, Sonia meeting her adopter. And you guys probably remember her. She was also from Bark. And um, she was a Freddy cat and uh, yeah. Yeah, she was, she, was she was great. And she let, you know, just because she was used to meeting new people and she had a bunch of behaviors that she could do with people in this case, high five, but she also did, you know, eye contact with him. And she also did like a finger target with him. And, yeah, I think Joe taught her high five. So there you go. Yeah. So, you know, he loved it that she can do those tricks. Um, so it's really important, you know, after you make your friends with the Freddy cat, more importantly, we have to get them used to meeting new people because at the shelter, they're going to need to meet adopters. So, okay, so I think we're just about at the end. There are some videos, I think that Suzanne's got to go. So, um, so I think we're going to wrap up. I can just show you some videos, but we, you can ask questions uh, now. Um, here's a video. While, while the video is running, you can ask whatever questions you have. This is a video of, so after graduating the Freddy Cat program, what do you do after that? Um, this is Vernon, that 16 or 17 year old Freddy Cat who now um, lives with Katie and John. And yeah, and we um, tr uh, crate trained him and this is him on his first day practicing uh, going into his crate on cue. Yeah, he was such a sweet cat. I love that cat so much. So, anybody have any questions about Freddy catting? I hope this encourages some of you to come in and work with our Freddy cats because they do need the help. They get relatively little attention compared to the dogs. Um, there's a there's kind of a debate out there about whether it's better to have one person working on these. Um, fearful cats or to have a number of people working on them all at once. Um, so that's still out there. But I, I feel like I've seen, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but I've definitely seen, seen improvement in the past when I've had new folks working on the Freddy cats. But I can't, I can't say for sure yet. That's relatively new. But I would love for you guys to come and meet the Freddy cats that we've moved up to Rocky's room now. And um, some of them are like polar ready to meet new people. Evie is probably ready to meet new people at night. <laughs> yeah. So pretty cat is kind of a spectrum, right? Because like polar doesn't necessarily mean it's negative reinforcement phase. No, right, exactly. And um, I just showed you the whole kind of protocol because I'm assuming that people won't know right away. And I really want to discourage people from doing too much experimentation, right? Because I can see, I could see that Polar had some pro-social interest early on. 
but um, I'm not 100% sure about other people. So I just want to encourage people to be cautious. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, some of, like I said, some of the Frady cats, they might just have some transition issues and it could just take them like a week. Um, or it could be like Priscilla, who was with us for a few months. Um, it felt like she was here forever, but I mean, compared to our behavior dogs, you know, these cats move through really quickly. Um, here's some co-op care with Priscilla, pre preparation for rabies vaccine, which she took from the doctor himself. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she did great. So any other questions about Frady Cat? You guys gonna come visit the Frady Cat? <laughs> I really have a question. Yeah. Would you apply the same protocol to um, Feral kittens, like the one in the back. Yeah, well, the orange kitten. In the back? I, I all I see was the kennel card that bright feral kitten. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, I, mean your own kind of, I would definitely do some of this stuff, but he's already, you know, I'm already <laughs> treating him, and he's, you know, eye you contact. Something different for kittens, so it's basically no, and it. that's a great question because, um, you know, in the past. Uh, people have always used it, used flooding to that's work with kittens, and that's really risky, and it can result in trauma. Um, it, it often uh, ends up with some shut down kittens, which people like, but it doesn't mean that the kittens are emotionally healthy. So, um, so yeah, I mean, this works for kittens, and it works a lot faster than. It works faster than you think. Like people are like, "Oh, this takes so much time," but um, but yeah, it works with kittens too. And and for those of you guys who don't know, like flooding is when you wrap up kittens in a little papoose and you force pet them. Oh yeah, it happens all the time. All righty. Um, anything else before? Thank we you. wrap up today. Oh, thank you. I've, I've, I've got to regroup a little bit and I think take a step back with sweeps because she's she's my problem child still. So. Oh, yeah. Let me know if you need any help. Um, yeah, well, I would love to have people come over because she actually enjoys playing, so she will come and play with anyone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, and play is really useful. Once you get to a certain level, play is super, super useful for pretty cats. She is, she definitely relaxes. So if we have yeah. a, um, a play session and then we have a training session, it works much better. The nice thing about play is that cats cannot feel scared and playful at the same time. So, you know, once you know for sure that the cat can play happily, then that play kind of displaces their fear. And then you can use toys like as a secondary reinforcer. So they associate the toy with feeling good, and then you transfer that toy really easily to another person. So, so yeah, so she, she loves that and she comes out. It's, it's still hands that she's still afraid of. Well, we'll have to talk about it later. I just don't want to, yeah. I don't want to mess up Suzanne because I no, know she absolutely. Has Suzanne. No, and I'll be in the shelter today, like in about an hour, so we can chat. But all I was going to say is if anyone feels um, comfortable enough to or coming over and they are currently in my office and just playing with the kittens with the lawn, then that might That's be a good fun. idea. Can you like make a video of them and post it or a picture of them and post it on the group and just solicit, it pe solicit people to come by? Sure, yeah. That would be great. So anyway. No, no, what happened to Suzanne? Of course, Suzanne is already 314. Oh, I think she left. She already left. Uh, <laughs> just hit stop recording at the end. Okay. End the meeting for all, all right, guys. Well, um, so next week we'll be watching a video uh, and I'll post up a, uh, and I'll post the correct date this time. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll post three different choices. So maybe one of them will be socialized with cats. I love that video. Uh, so I'll see you guys next time. Have a great week. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 -bye. <laughs> oh, with us. <laughs> oh, look at Shan. Still safe. <laughs> I didn't know who else who all was here. I can see you guys.
All right, I'm going to stop the meeting. Okay, bye-bye. Everything takes so long. I know, I hate that now. That was like...